designated introvert set. It's time. Quick, stop. Knock it off. No more, no more uh, greeting one another. So, not really, I don't have one yet, but it's such a good idea. Uh, and all the introverts said, amen. They're not, oh, introverts say amen. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know, what they, I didn't know what they would say. All right, so welcome. Glad to see you. Welcome those of you that are joining us online, those of you that are here in person. Um, we, uh, if you didn't hear last week, we made an announcement that Jesus is in yes. what? Jesus. The Super Bowl. Jesus is in the Super Bowl. All right, you didn't, some of you didn't know that Jesus is in the Super Bowl, but he is. So there's a campaign. He gets us. Um, and we are doing a series kind of based on, on this idea that Jesus gets us, that he is, uh, that he understands us. He, he, he gets us, he gets it. And so today, uh, during the Super Bowl, uh, I think I shared with you last week, um, actually like the times that this was going to happen. So if you just want to skip it and set your alarm, I don't know how that, I don't know how that would work, but, um, there's a couple ads from the He Gets Us campaign. And so what you, if you received a bulletin, you should have received uh, one of these. These are like little talking points. Uh, talking points, is that the right, is that the right way to uh, say it? Um, this is just a, a short guide for you to open up a conversation with maybe the folks that you're watching the Super Bowl with. Hmm, that was sort of a weird ad, he gets us. What do you suppose that is all about? And, uh, or, or later, because folks always talk about, of course, you know, the, uh, the ads more than uh, the game itself. Maybe the game will be worthy of conversation this year. I don't know. Uh, do we have favorites? It's the Chiefs. Who's for the Chiefs? All right. Three big, big Chiefs fans in place. Eagles? Eagles? All right. All right. So three against four. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be, wow, the... The animosity and the tension in the place. And uh, then folks are just watching the commercial. You didn't, even raise, you didn't raise your hand? Okay. All right. So this is just uh, something to help you. And then maybe in the workplace, you know, when they're talking about that. Next uh, slide we'll take a look at here is, I don't remember, but it's from last week. So I'm going to, we want to put it up this week. It's a little, it's a little laggy today. Right. So get connected. Yeah, you can text Super Bowl to this number and, uh, and they will send you updates. They will send you some stuff about he gets us. Now, this is dangerous and somebody would probably advise against this, but, you know, there's a, there's a little voice inside me that says, don't do this. But I never listen to that voice. Um, there's another voice. Anyone know what movie that is? But I never, there's a little voice inside that says, don't do that. But I never listen to that voice. Um, cat in the hat. All right. Um, so we've got some, some swag. I don't know. We have T-shirts. All right. Who needs a medium? Who wants a medium? Nobody. Okay, good. All right. Extra large. Somebody said, all right, here, here it comes. I, I noticed there's some folks I don't know well right in front of you. <laughs> I was so bold before, now I'm scared. All right, there you go. Marine, you got it? All right. Uh, it'd be, uh, you, can, you can smack the regulars in the head with a t-shirt. You don't know the people well. You, don't, you want it less smacking in the head. All right, another extra large? All right, Bob, coming at you. That was a terrible throw. Now you know why I'm not in the Super Bowl. There's so many reasons why I'm not. Uh, another extra, all right, I got a lot of extra large. Large? All right, Jeffrey. There you go, look at that, another Marine. Extra large again, extra large, where's all that? Okay, all right. That's not, do we have more extra large people? Was there more? Did I give away the medium? There's more somewhere, extra large. Do we need an extra large? Oh, extra large, all right. All right, here it comes, ready? All right, this is bad. It doesn't, it's not been going well so far. Large, was there, did I see a large somewhere? All right, so the, the ladies are like, yeah, I will get mine after, I'm not gonna. <laughs> No judgment here. It's church, right? Then we went in last week. Jeez, a medium? Did I hear a medium? All right, medium. All right. Got to be quick. Z, extra large. All right. A little bit more? Should we do a little bit more? Renee actually looked online for the cannon. Thought that was an overkill. The t-shirt cannon in this small room. Oh, man. There's a lot of extra larges here. Extra large. Medium. Another medium. Z. All right. Wait. Oh, sorry. Sista. All right, another medium. Wait, what? 
Alert. We can all count. We'll see if we have some left. All right. What? Medium. Medium? All right. Here we go. You, okay, they're all going to turn left. They're all going to go left a little bit. Is it all right if we take time to throw things at people? Medium? Was there another medium? All right, this one's on hold because you said another medium, right? No, large. Oh, what did you say, large? Large. I'll take a medium. Large. All right, large. Medium? Medium, medium. Straight at you. Look at that. I can learn. Large. Large. That's for someone. Oh, wait, he's here today. Yeah, okay. All right, I saw him. He's just not sitting right. Okay. All right. We're... All right. Uh, another large? All right, large. Is this? Okay. Uh, large, large, large. We're living. That's how we're living today. Lakeside, large. We're living large. All right. Try to account for the curve. I did it. It's amazing. That's enough of that. All right. Oh, and we have uh, stickers too. Stickers. <laughs> I will never be able to throw these, but stickers too. Get your st stickers, stickers, get your stickers. All right. Um, so they're, they're all up here if you want to get some. Later. Now, if you didn't get your size, was there more extra? We have a lot of extra large. Double Any yet? We, we th I thought we had some. So you can also go to, um, he gets us, he gets us fans. Dot com, I believe it is. He gets us fans. Dot com, and uh, you can just get you can just get your own. If if we don't have your size here, uh, they will just send you one out for free. I think a shirt, a, a sticker, and a hat. And so I'm I'm waiting on that. They have some new T-shirts coming out, so I think I'm waiting on mine. But we still have you know there's still some more in the box, and so we can try to hook you up if you need some. All right, so. Um, maybe we should have waited. We'll get into the message, and then when you start to fall asleep, you know, the T-shirt, the T-shirt might be coming your way. All right, I want to jump right into the scriptures here. So, so we're uh, we're talking about He gets us. All right, and if there's anything that the incarnation, that God who came as man teaches us, it's that He understands much of what we're going through, because Jesus was God. He never ceased to be God, but uh, He also um, is man, was man, is man, um, and I'm seeing a video. So let's let's show uh, a little video promotion for uh, today's message. Thank you for reminding me. A young mother had a son, a kind-hearted boy who always tried to do what's right. As he grew older, he worried about others more than himself. Whenever he saw anyone suffering. He tried to heal and comfort them, but more people became sick. Disease ravaged the land. People were quarantined, isolated. Many didn't survive. It became too much, and he had to isolate himself. He cried as he thought about all the unbearable things the people were going through. The mental anguish racked him with sorrow. But it was his cross to bear. All right, so that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about the amazing, extraordinary, remarkable compassion of Jesus. I love this subject. So we want to look at the scriptures here this morning. Just uh, a few short scriptures uh, today. Um, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, the word says this, that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, I love this, he had what? Compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He went on to say, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Amen. Love that passage of scripture. Um, in 1985, a 49-year-old lady by the name of Bridget Gurney uh, walked, was walking home from the dentist, and she had the most remarkable, remarkable, not the word, horrific experience. Um, something really incredible happened to her. 
Um, a massive crane on top of a skyscraper fell off, plunging several stories down, landing on Bridget's legs. Amazingly, she was not killed. And even more amazingly, she would walk again and live to be 85 years old, passing away in 2021. She was pinned to the street for over six hours while rescue workers and emergency personnel tried to get her out from that enormous piece of steel. How did she survive an experience like that? Emergency worker Paul, uh, I practice this, Ragonese, Ragonese, um, arrived on the scene and saw her unable to move and held her hand for six hours. They eventually pulled her out from under the crane, rushed her to the hospital. She went through one surgery after another. And about two months later, when she came out of the hospital, of course, the the news was there and they wanted to interview, interview her and talk to her about now she's finally going home after about two months. And they asked her, would you tell us the one thing that made the biggest difference to you? What really got you through and what, was, um, what made the difference in surviving this ordeal? Her answer was quite simple. You probably already have predicted it. She said it was Paul holding my hand. After two months in the hospital, that was what she focused on. It was someone, a stranger, showing her compassion. I mean, six hours worth of compassion. The compassion of a stranger to someone else made all the difference. Now, if you live very long on this earth, you're going to probably uh, need some compassion of your own. Like, like, we don't get out of this place unscathed, I like to say. Um, you will find that you're in one of these states, you're in trouble or you're just getting out of trouble. What's the other option? Or you're just about to get into trouble. Um, that, that happens to me a lot. But what we want you to know this morning is that Jesus gets us. Jesus gets you. Jesus gets us. Jesus understands what it's like to live in the muck and the mire, to live in humanity and live in a fallen, broken world because he lived here with us. Jesus gets us. Um, he looks at us with eyes of compassion. Now we could stop right there. I won't. I say that often. <laughs> we could stop right there. But Jesus looks at us with eyes of compassion. Isn't that good news? There are so many that think that God is the bad guy. He's out to get them. He's out to crush them. He's out to teach them a lesson. He might be out to teach you a lesson, but without that facial expression that I just made. He's out to teach you a lesson, not out to teach you a lesson, right? Uh, it makes all the difference. Like, we might learn some things along the way, but he's the good guy, and he looks at you with compassion. And when we look at the compassion that Jesus showed, it was extraordinary. It was unlike anyone else and was focused on those that uh, were often ignored by the world around them. As Jesus is busy ministering in the region, going about um, teaching and preaching, uh, laying hands on and healing the sick, he had time and was really motivated, not had time for, but was motivated out of a heart of compassion. So how do we learn the compassion of Jesus? Well, first I want to share with you this morning, I want to encourage you to see people as Jesus saw them. Um, the scripture tell us in Matthew, tells us in Matthew 9, 36, that when he saw the crowds, right, Jesus is ministering to the people. When he saw the crowds, he saw them, he looked upon them and had compassion on them because it, it goes on to say little, I don't know, the word harassed, we'll talk about that in just a minute. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'll ask you the question here this morning, how do we see other people, right? And so I'll, I'll take you back to high school um, or to the breakfast club, because I think at the end they talk about all the different classes, right? There's the, the nerds and the geeks. Were those different? I don't know, in the 80s, I don't know if nerds and geeks were different. Now they're different. Um, but I think, they, I think they were the same back then. Uh, there was the cool kids. There was the preppies. Notice I left that other group that's usually mentioned first. I, I didn't mention them first. Who did I leave out? 
the jocks. <laughs> we, lo we love you, jocks. I was, I was not really one, but the jocks are great. But even on my list, the jocks were first. So I just kind of rearranged things uh, out of my compassion. But we, we love them all, right? There's the preppies. And, and, and on and on and on the labels went. Maybe you had uh, some different labels. Um, anybody want to shout out one or two that, that aren't offensive? <laughs> um, all right. Moving on. That was dangerous. Um, but right, that's a, that's a common thing. We'd like to see people and put them in their category and categorize them, and this is where you fit, and this is where you belong. I'm told that the reason, there's a show, none of you probably ever heard of it, The Office. Um, um, I know there's Office fans here, that's why I said that. Uh, one of the reasons why The Office was such a big hit was because um, it identified stereotypes of people that we can all identify with in the workplace. Right? That's one of the things that resonated with that television program. Uh, but how many of you know that people are more than just a stereotype? Right? And people are more than just their, their past mistakes. You are more than just your past mistakes. Yeah. This morning, I want to encourage you to look at people and see people the way that Jesus looked on people. The scripture tells us that they were harassed and helpless. Okay, I got a bunch of definitions for harassed and helpless. Uh, helpless. So um, I looked up uh, several different um, scholars, and uh, one said this means bullied or oppressed. I think this is important. Unable to rescue themselves or to escape their tormentors, right? Um, the former, so harassed, means worn out. <laughs> you ever just felt worn out? The Bible says that Jesus looked upon these people with compassion and they were just worn out. They had had enough. The latter phrase, helpless, um, literally means prostrate or to be thrown to the ground. I think one commentator, I might, I might have included this one. Uh, I'll wait until I read uh, a few of these definitions. I could have stopped there, but I, I liked um, how the explanations of harassed and helpless went on. Um, one commentator wrote, like sheep bothered by wolves, lying down and unable to help themselves, and having no shepherd to guide and protect them, the people were maligned by the religious leaders. And those religious leaders, we, we have to include them, right? So they were part of the problem. Um, we, see it, old, we see this in the Old Testament that the religious leaders were, were characterized as, as shepherds. And sometimes the shepherds were doing well, and very often the shepherds weren't being good shepherds. And so that theme continues into the New Testament here. And that's how Jesus is, I, that's how Jesus is identifying the religious leaders of the day. And we talked about them a little bit last week. Um, they were a part of the problem. More on that in a moment. Helpless before them and wandering about with no spiritual guidance. The religious leaders who should have been their shepherds were keeping the sheep from following the true shepherd. Isn't, isn't that the truth? All right. I'm probably overdoing it, but there were so many good definitions of what, or, or, or bad definitions of what these two words, um, harassed and helpless, mean. Um, I, I had to include this. Rent, as in rent into or rent into pieces, or maligned as if by wild beasts. This morning we're talking about the, com the compassion of Jesus. And these are all great definitions of how Jesus viewed the hurting world around him. He viewed them as though they were rent into pieces or maligned as if by wild beasts. Some of that, no doubt, was just the fallen world. Some of that was because of things that they had done. And specifically, Jesus is sort of pinpointing the, the religious guys. So many times the religious guys are the problem. And so this morning we're talking about the compassion that Jesus had. And, and I want you to see as he looked at hurting people, he had compassion on them. Didn't look down on them. Didn't say, well, you're, you're here because of your own mistakes. And you're one of this class. And you're one of these types. And, oh, you're one of those people. Jesus didn't look at others that way. He looked upon them with compassion. Parents, if you want to ruin your children's childhood, 
I say facetiously. Um, I've done this to my kids, ruined their childhood. And I learned this from, I learned this from my mom, how to see people like Jesus. Well, how do you do that? I looked up online. How do you, how do you have compassion on others? And the first things that I clicked on were just dumb. I didn't like them. So here's my idea uh, of, because uh, my parents taught me right. Um, how do you have compassion on others? So, you know, there's this, not you, but someone you know. There's this thing inside of us that likes to demean and belittle and think negatively about others. And so when I was very, very young, I would uh, find pleasure in saying negative things about people. And my parents ruined my childhood because they would say things often like, well, maybe that person had this terrible thing happen to them. And maybe that's why so-and-so wears the dumbest clothes uh, all the time. Well, maybe they don't have money. And maybe mom or dad lost their job. And maybe they can't afford nice clothes. And, and that little nice, happy thing that you get inside when you make fun of other people and you feel better about yourself just was deflated. And I felt like a jerk, right? And then I would say, oh, this kid at school, he smells. You know, he smells so bad. Well, maybe they can't afford soap. You've never, like, we might have run out and somebody didn't make it to the store, but we were never in a position where, like, sorry, kids, we can't afford to buy soap. And so instead of reveling in my wonderful odor, <laughs> odor, um, the fact that I was rich enough to have soap, my parents ruined it. And they said, well, maybe so-and-so can't afford soap. Well, you, you look at things a little differently when you begin to put yourself in other people's shoes and think about maybe there's reasons why they're in this situation. Maybe horrible things have happened. And on and on and on, the more I tried to make fun of people, the more my mom would say, well, maybe they had this horrible thing. And she never said, you're an evil jerk. But it was still kind of in the tone. You know what I mean? Like it was still, it was still sort of... Still, but that's sort of how you came away with it. How many of you know you eventually learn, I'm going to shut my mouth. Because I know what comes next is I'm going to feel awful. <laughs> right? So that's, uh, that's the toy fatty method of teaching compassion to children. Um, respond with uh, Jules. We should, you can ask my sister for testimony later. She's probably got her own stories. All right? So see people like Jesus uh, saw them. If you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, it's so much easier to have compassion on them. The stuff I clicked online said, first, you have to have compassion on yourself. I said, that's dumb. Uh, I went to the next one. First, have compassion on you. Maybe it's great, but I didn't even read it. I don't need more compassion on myself. If anything, I need to go the other way. Like, straighten up your act, pal, <laughs> right? Like, take it easy on yourself is probably not uh, what I need. Um, so I dismissed all that. So maybe that's good. I don't know. But I, I like the petty way of just thinking maybe something awful and catastrophic has happened to someone. Like, um, it's easier to have compassion on them when you look at them through those eyes. Um, and I want you to see that God is drawn to those. Actually, it's easy to get into uh, uh, the, the frame of mind and thinking, you know, I'm in this situation because God's ignoring me. I'm in this situation because God doesn't answer my prayers or he doesn't pay any attention to me. But the scriptures really show us another side, show us a different side than what we might sometimes feel. The reality is that Jesus is drawn to those that are hurting. Jesus is drawn to those that are wounded and broken and suffering. And he doesn't simply condescend and, and look down with pity, but has compassion. He really saw those in need. I love this story. William and Catherine Booth founded the Salvation Army, a Salvation Army in 1865. They were both focused on those in the, their community that were ignored, abused, and marginalized in London. And so there was a tradition. Every Christmas, uh, there was a tradition in London that churches would send out representatives and call people to uh, service. So the Anglicans would, would call for Anglicans, and the Methodists would call for Methodists, and the Catholics would call for Catholics. You get the idea. So on and so on. And after all the invitations were given, and the remainder without churches were left, 
Then Booth would shout out to the people, I love this quote, all of you who belong to no one, come with me. And that's the kind of attitude Jesus had. May God give us a generation of Christians who have the compassion of William and Catherine Booth. The second thing that I want to talk about this morning, um, so first, see people the way that Jesus saw people. Secondly, be moved the way Jesus was moved. Matthew 9, 36 said that he had compassion on them. We talked about this a little bit a moment ago, but um, I looked at some definitions of of uh, helpless and harassed. Harassed, I think, is a, a, a strange word for uh, the English translation. But I'm going to look a little bit at, at compassion. Um, compassion has been defined as to feel deep sympathy or to suffer along with someone. Isn't that amazing? To suffer along with them. Like if they're suffering, there's something in us. There was something in Jesus that suffered along with the individual. So this morning, when we talk about he gets us, that Jesus gets us, he knows what we've gone through. He knows our brokenness and how uh, we're wounded because he suffers and suffered those things along with us. He did in his earthly ministry, and how many of you know, he still does today. Compassion, now I, I included this um, I thought this was sort of a, a strange one, but so powerful. Um, one scholar wrote that compassion is literally bowels as a gut-wrenching concern. He went on to say that Jesus was physically moved by a stomach-wrenching empathy for the plight of the hurting. He gets us. He knows what we're going through. He was literally sickened by uh, the leadership of Israel's uh, hypocritic, uh, uh, hypocritic religious leaders. Jesus was on a mission. He was a man on a mission. Most of you are probably familiar with the story. Um, when we talk about mission and how he was, had purpose and was driven by uh, compassion for others, um, the power of mission can be illustrated uh, by a story. Again, I, I, some of you probably heard this story, but in 1983, John Scully uh, met Steve Jobs while he was the CEO of Pepsi. And Apple was a young company, and Pepsi, of course, was a, a giant. And Steve Jobs asked Scully to come along and join him at Apple, you know, leave the giant, be the CEO of the giant company, and come uh, join me in this startup. And some of you know the line that he used, the thing that really uh, got to Scully and motivated him to actually leave Pepsi and join this new upstart Apple. Uh, Jobs told him, well, if you want to... <laughs> I think this is funny. If you want to shell, sell sugar water for the rest of your life, uh, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or do you want to come with me and change the world? <laughs> a little snotty, but it worked. It got, it got in his head, and he, he couldn't escape the question. And it, that question convinced Scully to leave uh, the CEO position at Pepsi and join Steve Jobs at Apple and transform Apple into one of the most revolutionary companies in the world. Do you want to sell sugar water? for the rest of your life, or do you want to change the world? For Christians, our challenge this morning, my challenge this morning, is that we be moved in the same way that Jesus was moved. I'm still trying to get to the same level that Jesus was moved, but, but it is an admirable goal to, to be moved in the way that Jesus was moved. Francis Schaeffer said this, biblical orthodoxy without compassion is surely the ugliest thing in the world. You can have Bible verses memorized. You can have good theology. You can answer all the questions. But if you don't have compassion, he says that's one of the ugliest things in the world. Compassion lies at the heart of Jesus' mission to the world. Someone said this, a Christian that stands on the sidelines does not reflect the mission of Jesus, no matter how good their theology appears. Compassion is what Christians are called to. All right, so my third point this morning is that we should pray the way that Jesus prayed. Look what Jesus said here in verse uh, 37 and 38. The Bible says that he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are 
few ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So we want to pray the way that Jesus prayed. And part of our, part of our prayer life should be, Lord, win the world. Send out people into the fields to reap a harvest of souls, right? So empowering his disciples was and is Jesus' plan for continuing ministry in the world. So I said to pray the way Jesus prayed, but I think there's a little bit of a, we can let ourselves off the hook. Well, you know, I prayed a couple times that the Lord would send people out into the fields to harvest. That's, uh, you know, first we had the sheep and the shepherd analogy, and now Jesus has uh, switched to agriculture, an agricultural picture. And so we say, well, you know, uh, every now and then I pray that the Lord would send out harvesters into the field to reap a harvest. In other words, win the lost for Christ. But I would encourage you this morning, don't just pray that, that the Lord would find someone to, to share the gospel with, with unbelievers or the unchurched, but maybe step up and be the one. Hence your, hence your little helpful little card here, right? Um, maybe be the one that leads someone to Christ. It's easy today to become discouraged in a world that seems increasingly disinterested in the things of God. But I, but I remind you this morning that Jesus reminds us that there is an abundant harvest out there. We might look around and say, well, nobody, you know, who's interested in the things of the Lord anymore? Well, Jesus said there's a, there's a harvest. Imagine you could be the answer to Jesus' prayer. When you're moved with compassion to care for others and tell them about Jesus. I challenge you this morning, will you be the answer to Jesus' prayer? That there will be people ready to share. So much I want to say on that. I won't. You don't have to take a class. You don't need training. You can grab the four spiritual laws and use that as a guide. If you just go through doors, the Lord opens. And we're, I'm praying that the Lord will open doors during these commercials, during the Super Bowl. And that when doors are open, that we say, all right, Lord, and we just walk through. Hey, what do you, what do you, suppose, what do you suppose that's all about? Um, I know that's a scary idea to many, but um, God can use you in that way. It's nice to have... Uh, you know, some training or go to evangelism classes or have a track memorized or whatever, but the Lord will lead you into saying the right thing for uh, the right people in the right situation. How many of you believe that? Yes. All right, four of you. Fantastic. That's as many, uh, that's as many Eagles fans as we have in the room. Right. This morning, <laughs> I think this is the first year I've ever, that I've been a pastor, that I looked up before the day of the Super Bowl. And, and figured out who the teams were. There might have been one or two other times, but usually I stand here and go, who's playing? Yeah. So were you impressed? Some of you, I know, you were impressed that I came up with Chiefs and Eagles all by myself. <laughs> Being kind. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, I feel like such a big boy. Um, all right. So uh, pray and answer Jesus' prayer. And, uh, and then finally, do what Jesus asks. Let's look at Matthew 9, 38. He says, we, we look at this, to send workers into his har harvest field, to send laborers, to send somebody out to gather the harvest. Um, that can literally be interpreted, to interpret it as driven out, that workers would be driven, forcefully driven out into the fields into the harvest. Now, in Acts 1.8, we won't take a look at that scripture this morning, but in Acts 1.8, Jesus called his disciples, not 12, his disciples, that's, that's, that's you and I, uh, called his disciples to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then if we fast forward to Acts chapter 8, we see that because of persecution, they were literally driven out of Jerusalem. Persecution caused them to flee their home. And what did they do? When they fled to foreign lands, they, they preached the gospel there. They shared Christ with it. They were literally driven out. Uh, it's like 
Jesus' prayer has been answered here and that there were laborers driven out into the field. Well, my prayer this morning is not that you'll be driven away from your home. Let's be clear. That's not my prayer this morning. Um, but, I, but I do pray that you would be ready, uh, available, that, you would, uh, that your ear be attuned to the Spirit's voice, that when you see a door open, that you'd be willing to step through it. Um, you'll, be, you'll be amazed. If you say, well, I've never done that before. I've never shared Christ before. I'm, thanks for the little thing in the bulletin, but I'm not sure if that's going to help me. I, I will tell you that if the Lord opens the door for you, he's going to do something. He's going to show up. He, I mean, I, I know this from experience. I've had my little spiel. It's, it sounds terrible to think of, to, to call sharing the gospel a spiel. But, you know, you got your, you know, you got your favorite verses, you got your thing. And I've tried to do that before with people where... Uh, uh, there was an opportunity. I just tried to do, well, this is what, this is my method of sharing Christ. And the same method didn't work for some people. I can, I can tell you the name, the names of some of these people where it's like, hmm, my, my usual tricks aren't working on this one, right? My, my normal, my normal way of, it's nice to have an idea of how to share the gospel, but for, for whatever reasons, reasons un, un, understood by me, um, the way I had kind of preconceived how to do this, and I'd done it before shared Christ, before with, with individuals, it just wasn't, it, was, it, it, wasn't, it just wasn't working. And so I allowed the you know, Spirit guide me, and, and I went a completely different route, stuff I've never said before or since, but it's what those people needed in that situation. So even though I thought I was prepared, I said, I don't know if that encourages you or discourages you. Um, Let's, let's hope you lean on the encouragement side. That if the Lord opens a door, yeah. that he's going to show up. Yeah. He's going to do something, right? Um, training's nice. Memorization is nice. Knowing the four spiritual laws is nice. But if the door's open and you, and you don't have those things down, just walk through it. Yeah. The, Lord, the, Lord will, the Lord will use you. Uh, amen. amen. So God continues to do that, to launch people into positions and places and and uh, opportunities to share the gospel. C.S. Lewis said this. He wrote that pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. Boy, isn't that the truth? Speaks in our consciences, consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I don't know about you, but I know myself. I have a tendency. If everything's great, I can get complacent in my relationship with the Lord. My ears can grow deaf when things, are, when things just go along perfectly, you know, for a day and a half. Come on, somebody, right? But when I'm suffering, like pain really, really gets my attention. I think C.S. Lewis is, is totally right here. And so there's an opportunity. Uh, I don't, we, don't, we don't relish in the suffering of others, but, but there's an opportunity for us to step in and bring healing that only Jesus can bring. Our, uh, a pain is a megaphone to rouse a deaf world. When Jesus saw the pain in the crowd that they were suffering, he saw there was something here that he could attend to. He saw that there was an opportunity for him to minister to them. It wasn't like a secondary or uh, a tang tangential um, opportunity. Like, while I'm doing this, I can also show compassion. Compassion <clears throat> was the bullseye. Compassion was what he was about. I would say that he was first and foremost about <clears throat> compassion and healing was, was an outgrowth of that. It wasn't some peripheral idea. It was dead center of his will for humankind to show us and display compassion. <clears throat> the compassion of Jesus caused him to stay focused on what mattered to him the most, showing and sharing the gospel, the good news. I'll close with this. Missiologist Rick Richardson discovered that almost half of those that are skeptical about the Christian faith, 49%, uh, he, he learned, place compassion as a value 
associated with Jesus, right? So they're skeptical about the Christian faith, but ask them about Jesus and questions and answers about compassion seem to rise to the surface. So those that aren't sure about this whole Christianity thing know, well, or, or 49% anyway, recognize that Jesus was a man of compassion. That's, that's uh, uh, a character trait that is associated with him. He went on to conclude, and I quote, those that cared or care about the physical, mental, and social needs of the community were the most likely to be the most effective at bringing people to Christ and to a congregation. So I want to encourage you um, this morning. Now, this applies to our lives. This isn't like, woo, made it past the Super Bowl and no doors were opened. I made it. Let's not go to church on the next Super Bowl Sunday, right? This isn't just about the Super Bowl, right? This is about, this is about life as God opens opportunities. I think this is wonderful training for how to open up a conversation because guess what? You don't need to wait for a Jesus commercial to come on during the Super Bowl. I, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm prayerful that, that if we take this seriously, that, that we'll begin to recognize other opportunities and we'll begin to look for other doors and we'll, this will be us uh, uh, getting our feet wet on how to open up a conversation and ask people questions about their spiritual life. So I wanted to talk about this this morning. We'll continue this series. We're doing this kind of a Super Bowl-ish kind of a thing, but we're going to continue this series after the Super Bowl. But I wanted to talk about uh, his compassion because uh, it's awesome if we recognize that Jesus is sympathetic and, and compassionate when we're hurting and when we're suffering and when we're wounded and when we're broken and when we're harassed. Um, but as a body of believers, I want to encourage you to embrace the compassion um, that, is, that, that is so central to our master, Jesus, and uh, that, we, that we might show compassion towards others. There's lots of different ways to do that. I've sort of focused this morning on just, just sharing the gospel with them. But there's lots of ways that we could be compassionate to others. Um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your compassion. Um, Lord, we're so grateful that you can identify with our suffering our brokenness and our wounds. That's true for every person in this place. Maybe, maybe somebody that's been a Christian for years and years and years, but that doesn't mean that, like, I, I definitely think that that's, there's an advantage to that. Like, I avoid tremendous amounts of pain and suffering by, by walking as close as I can with, with God's will for my life. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything goes, that everything goes perfect. And so, Lord, I'm grateful for your compassion that extends to each and every person in this room, each and every person within the sound of my voice, each and every person that we might spend time later today <clears throat> watching uh, this, this sporting event, but such a major thing in, uh, in our culture. And Lord, I am so grateful that you have presented us with opportunities to, uh, even for those that are faint of heart, even, of the, even for those that might be nervous about it, um, that you've provided a way for us to start a conversation. And so, Lord God, I just pray later today, not only for those um, at Lakeside and those that might be with us, joining us online today, but throughout our nation, that, that this campaign, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I've seen some great campaigns, but to advertise during the Super Bowl, that's, that's a gutsy move, <laughs> man. That is, that is outrageous. And so, Lord, I pray that there will be fruit from this, yes. like, we know that somebody's going to come to know you through this. Like, we know that. Like, the, it, it's impossible for me to conceive that, no, that nobody in, a, in something this big is going to come to know you. But, Lord, we pray for revival. We pray for multitudes and multitudes yes. of, of people coming to Christ or, or beginning that walk. I mean, sometimes there's a, there's a journey between um, God getting their attention and them actually coming to Christ. I, I, you know, I don't know that people are going to see a commercial during the Super Bowl and cave 
and cry out to the Lord right there and give their hearts and lives to Christ. But, but Lord, <clears throat> you can start a conversation with them. And so I pray that your spirit would do a work all over this nation through this incredible, powerful, gutsy, and expensive campaign. Um, Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you. We give you honor and glory for it. In Jesus' awesome and mighty name, amen. Amen. So somebody mentioned, too, um, these T-shirts are free, by the way. <clears throat> they said, how many T-shirts you want? Your church can have 50. So I've got 50 T-shirts. Um, I'm like, I kept waiting for them to just give your credit card and then cancel it within the days that you're going to forget. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Like, I kept waiting. And they're like, they never asked for the credit card. Wait, these, these shirts might actually be free. They might be. And so I'm, I'm looking, you know, the, I'm so skeptical, you know, man of faith. And... Uh, I'm waiting for the shipping charges or something, nothing. So, yeah, I don't know, I don't know how much an ad in the Super Bowl costs these days, um, but, but this organization, I mean, they're committed to evangelism, not even a shipping. They paid the shipping on these T-shirts. So, um, so that's why we provide them to you free of charge. Bumper stickers, too. Um, now, if you like, <coughs> excuse me, somebody mentioned... Um, well, maybe we should ask for a donation for the T-shirts. And so I'm a, little, uh, I'm a little weird about that. But some people actually wanted to pay. So if you, if you would like to just, somebody said five bucks. If you want to give five, T-shirts are free. I'm not charging you for the T-shirts. But if you go, eh, you know, whatever, I can give five bucks. If you want to include that in your offering, when we do that later, just mark um, other. Um, or you can go to the Envision Fund, which I plan to talk about, but I'm out of time this morning. Um, but... That's just if the Lord leads you. They're, they're free other than that, all right? Um, so we've got a bunch left. I said it was going to be a first come, first serve. So now if so-and-so is not here and uh, you want to come and grab a T-shirt for, for whoever, or if you didn't want, me to, you know, didn't want me to throw it to you, I'm sure there's you know, still a, a number um, left in there. All right? So, all right. So praise the Lord. Happy anniversary, Lakeside. Um, we didn't make much of our anniversary, although we do have cake. You know, I just have to, I do want to complain about one thing. We decided to have a soup luncheon on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> and that was an accident. And that was initiated by a sports guy, right? And nobody thought to call it soup or bowl luncheon. I thought of it like Friday evening. I can't tell you the shame <laughs> that came over me, the disgust. I'm so, I was horrified that I, could, that I didn't think. T so right now, it's Super Bowl luncheon. Got some good marketing a couple minutes before it happens, isn't it? That's amazing, right? Um, well, you know, late. For the work, wait, not, I guess. Uh, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And I think, uh, Kenny, do you have any announcements for us this morning? Oh, we got we got time for a video and. Uh...